I've, I've gone to one of these uh, adaptogenic um, beverages, uh, mushrooms and twigs and things like that. Oh, nice. Don't the twigs like go down hard? Uh, the twigs are ground up and the mushrooms are really, <laughs> mushrooms are really wild and it's very good. The energy is clean and smooth. Do you go to zero to 60 in three seconds now or? I'm just, I'm just strolling, man. <laughs> Um, well, we are here for the uh, OGM weekly call on Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. I am just getting over a tiny cold. I tested negative on COVID tests a couple of times, so it's not that, but <clears throat> my voice is a little gravelly and I will go on mute because I have a little cough now and then. And we are in check-in mode, which has been quite interesting of late, uh, more like quicker meeting than anything else. Uh, Jesse, I think you're the only one who hasn't been here for a recent uh, check-in, so I'll, I'll explain the, the protocol. Um, and what we do is I will step out of the conversation entirely. Uh, whoever wants to go next can volunteer into the queue, either you know just raise your hand, your electronic Zoom hand, or uh, just step in if nobody's, if nobody's talking. Um, only go once during the check-in part of the conversation. Uh, so don't, this is not a conversational part. We're not replying to everybody else. And there's considerable controversy over whether or not to use the chat because using the chat is distracting and not very much like Quaker meeting. And we the, 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 the calls at least two weeks ago started feeling like Quaker meeting because there were long stretches of silence where we were kind of, kind of like hanging out, which is, and I, I'm a huge fan of Quaker meeting. Um, and so I'm uh, happy to take a, a vote or something like that on whether or not to use the chat today. Um, anybody, anybody. Um, so Gil says, let's experiment with no chat. Um, Pete and I are probably the two people who are most compulsive about needing to look everything up that anybody says and then share it back into the chat. Pete, will either of us explode if this happens? I can type a bunch of stuff on a notepad. Seems like a shame not to share it, but <laughs> but I totally also get the uh, uh, I I get the idea of uh, meeting reverence. So and, I, and I the lack of presence. I, I I love to chat. I love using the chat. I love the, I love what people put in the chat. But I noticed last time that I was not fully, I was not a quick re meeting thing. So and it wasn't it, we, and it wasn't meant to emulate a quicker meeting it just started feeling a little quicker meeting ish which which and you know the chat is one of those levers we can try and stacy you had your hand up yeah i was going to suggest a compromise of leaving it open to put like one sentence in as a place marker if you just wanted to get something there for the future so i'm thinking that pete's suggestion is really good which is those of us compelled to do so can take notes in a note pad application and then when we were done with the check-in section we'll just pour those into the chat and then they'll they'll exist there for everybody and that that makes it so the chat is clean uh through this portion until we're all checked in let's do that uh let's go with that today and uh, and pete uh, we should be mindful also that our note taking even while in a notepad is distraction and whatever uh and i will say that and i'm not sure how much how strongly i feel about this but like kalia hamlin when she attends a meeting she brings her pastels and she sits on the ground and starts coloring because that allows her to be present because distracting her mind with some coloring lets the rest of her show up and be present in the conversation. And she ain't missing a thing in the room, but she needs that. And Pete, I don't know how much you and I need to like note take to be present. It's the same thing for me. It feels a little, feels a, a little like that, which is why I bring that up. <laughs> to me, it feels a lot like that. Um, and it could so, be doodling just as easily, but um I, I apologize. I also, I'm going to have to leave at the hour. Um, so, and Pete has a different call he's running uh, that he has to switch to. Um, cool. So it sounds like the guidance is be present. Yes. And be present is the, is the way to go. Um, and then uh, if it so happens that we start talking pretty quickly after each other, take your time stepping into the conversation. A piece of how this all started was that our normal weekly calls were like, boop, 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 boop. And we started inserting some mindful pauses between uh, participating. Um, and so, uh, Doug, you had your hand up. Was that a comment for now, or was that you? Did you want to check in? Um, no, it was just a comment. I so I've been practicing for the last three, four years. I've been doing cha cha what George Poor dubbed chaotic chat, uh -huh. which is literally real time transcription of everything. 
what and yeah i have i have notes of ogm meetings i every meeting i'm in i do that in real time and it is a manipulative augmentation of attentional focus for me hmm. um it is not something that is in the same space as a chat signal from the zoom room as a as an additional channel of incoming mm -hmm. um which i do find like violently challenging and disruptive um of my attentional lock on whatever's being said by whoever whenever so this whole attentional thing is actually really deep <laughs> i i have a group of people and mm -hmm. somebody really likes having a miro board going because of that augmentation for him and somebody else that's like completely blows up their brain and makes it impossible for them to track. So it's just, um, this is deep water, not shallow water in terms of all of these facets. Go ahead, Doug, uh, Doug C. It's interesting that most of the comments are about the person writing in chat. Uh, I think it's possible to write and listen fairly easily. It's much harder to read and listen. So I'm much more concerned about what's happening to the people who are trying to track what we're reading. So it does not distress you if some of us are busy note-taking or typing or doing whatever else? No, it doesn't bother me. Uh, and the psychologist the psychology for the listener is that uh, what's being listened to stimulates not only the surface layer of the meaning, but deeper layers that are kind of unconscious. But if they're reading a chat, it breaks the connection to those deeper layers. And so one's left with just a superficial uh, series of words. <laughs> well, I'm going to intercept us getting into a conversation about that right now and ask that we go into silence and whoever wants to lead off, uh, either jump in or raise your hand and then jump in. And I will not be handing off between people, so I won't acknowledge anybody until we're kind of all done checking in. If somebody else joins the group and doesn't know the rules, I might, I might jump in and explain them or type them into the chat which is annoying, but sort of necessary so that people understand what's happening. And um, did I forget any rules? I think there were more rules, but, uh, and, and this uh, the idea here is not to have a conversation with each other through what we say, uh, but rather to check mm -hmm. in and what's happening with us, you know, in an OGM kind of way or in the world, et cetera. With that, I will mute myself and let's go. I guess I'll go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. Um, so first of all, I invited my my mom, Karen, who um, has been on the list for a while now, um, but she's here, Karen, uh, offline. So she might kind of just listen in this first time. But um, yes, welcome. She's the smartest woman I know. And so you'll really enjoy her conversations once you get in, involved in um those discussions. So let's see. Checking in. Um, I really appreciate your <laughs> caffeine comment because I'm off of caffeine for the next two weeks, uh, Jerry. And it's um, it's really hard. It is really hard. I don't know why a small little drink every day, how you start off a, a whole day, it can change everything <laughs> when you're when you have a routine. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, I'm not fully here and I really want to be, so I'm looking for other, other options besides just tea. So I appreciate the attention thing as well for a chat. I start reading the chat and I don't listen to the person talking. I just can't do both. I don't think our brains can do both. So thank you for that. And, um, I've been very much involved in the topic of food lately. 
I was uh, really, really trying to do SDGs, you know, diving into that, making change, making waves, going with systems thinking, creating these gigantic systems maps. And I realized I have to just start in my own brain, in my own backyard. And where does everything connect? Food. Hmm. And I know some of you are um, very much into this topic. Um, so I went from completely flexitarian in June when I was laid off of Amazon and I finally had time on my hands to actually practice a different diet, which is whole food plant-based. And I was having a lot of troubles. So um, I did it for environmental. I did it for health. I did it for many reasons, but yeah, I had a hard time. So I've been just struggling and moving through the, the, the motion of, figuring out how to eat well and in limitations, but I don't like using limitations. It's more like expansion, a whole nother version of expansion and making changes there. Um, in my struggle, I created an app to help myself. And now I'm just kind of beta testing it with other people. So if anybody's interested in um, having a little view of a beta test version, I'm all for that. Other than that, um, I'm I'm moving into this winter, looking at the dark, dreary skies right now in Seattle, and thinking I need coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll go and I'll be curmudgeon as I seem to be lately. Uh, the silence uh, disturbs me. I mean, here we have such an intelligent group of people and we're acting as though we're in conversations about the world's troubles all the time and we need to be here in order to uh, be silent in order to recover. I don't believe that we're in such good conversations and why we aren't trying to have one puzzles me. Silence is a funny thing. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've learned that silence can actually be an important part of conversations. Um, and I'm remembering 10, 10 years ago, eight years ago, I was involved in a project with some people out of the Ken Wilber universe to produce a five-day immersive sustainability training uh, that was by design, mind, body, spirit. And it was a remarkable thing. I'll show happy to talk about another time. Um, but um, I was really disoriented by the planning meetings because every planning meeting started with a 20 minute silent meditation of the group together. And I found it very uncomfortable at first and then deeply, deeply rewarding um, for what, what happened in the rest of the meetings uh, and the opportunity to settle and reflect together in silence um, was as valuable as the things that we said to each other afterwards. Uh, so um, um, and sometimes it's uncomfortable for me and sometimes not. Um, I know that when we're silent together, there's a lot going on behind all these sets of eyes and maybe individual and isolated, but maybe not. So I'm intrigued by that. Um, <clears throat> I know we're not supposed to respond, but I'm 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 fed by some of what's been said already. Um, um, I mentioned adaptogenic beverage. I'll put something in the chat when we're permitted to do that by the chat police, which I am one apparently. Um, 
but on diet, I've been on a ketogenic diet for the last couple of months um, and have found uh, well, I've dropped 10 or 15 pounds, um, lost a whole bunch of belly fat that I've been trying to shake for 15 years. And I think I'm about to transition back into some ad adaptation of a normal uh, diet. Um, but that, the um, dropping carbs and doing intermittent fasting um, has been very, has been good for me. Um, I guess um, what else is going on for me is I'm, um, I'm um, still moving in and out of PTSD um, in relation to the uh, um, what to call it, the mess in the Middle East, the death in the Middle East. Um, um, some days of being very immobilized by it and other days of being relatively normal until I'm not. And I shared something in Plex uh, yesterday, Pete, thanks for that. Um, that's sort of where, where I've come to in the course of that. Um, um, it's made for, it's made for a strange work experience, being able to concentrate and being, and being not able to concentrate, which, uh, um, my sister, who's a psychotherapist, uh, you know, labeled as PTSD a couple of days in. I just, you know, I didn't see it as that, but it seems pretty classic. Post post traumatic stress syndrome and pre traumatic stress syndrome. You know, waiting for the next shoe to drop. Um, uh, part of the in and out has been uh, pivoting on critical path capital. Um, for those of you who are who don't know, this is an, an effort to build a holding company to buy small and medium-sized climate-relevant companies from retiring um, owners and uh, lift their value, sharpen their focus, and improve their work process and put them in the hands of their employees. Um, and we've uh, come to the conclusion that that that. Um, Taking the guidance of all sorts of people who said you really got to focus, focus very tightly on a particular niche was the wrong strategy. And this is now moving into a portfolio, a diversified portfolio of many different kinds of climate relevant companies, um, possibly with not just cooperative, not just employee ownership of the individual businesses, but cross ownership of the businesses with each other. We're taking a page from the ergodic uh, entrepreneur principles that Graham Boyd out of uh, Belgium has been working on um, seems to be a way of providing a lot more meta stability across a network. So um, we're looking at how to build a financial stack uh, that will do that. <clears throat> uh, and in other news, I'm um, going to be the kickoff speaker Monday at a four-day solutions summit coming out of the Rayburn office building in Congress um, produced by Eleanor LeCain uh, <clears throat> and Monday is the climate day with me and Mark Jacobson from Stanford and Rebecca Solnit, uh, who many of you know, and a couple of other folks. And so I've been both building my own, I get to do a four minute opening presentation and then a 20 minute interview of me. And so I've been working to distill, you know, if I get four minutes with a stack of federal and state and local elected officials, what's the essence of what I need to tell them? Uh, and so I built my own draft, and then I went um, to the LinkedIn crowd to say, what would you say? And I got a very rich and fairly convergent perspective from, I don't know, about 40 or 50 people there, uh, several of whom went to ChatGPT to invite it into the crowdsourcing. And again, surprisingly convergent. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but it's, inter it's an interesting thing. And so that's just sort of bubbling slowly in the background. I do a half hour here and an hour there, and it will gradually coalesce by Sunday. And then we'll do that Monday at all. I can share a link for that later on as well. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's what I got for you right now. Thank you. Oh, and I'm, of course, open to your suggestions of what to tell these folks on Monday.
Uh, I'll go. Um, I'll I'll try to put some uh, links to some of the things I'm talking about in chat later, but it might also end up on uh, the Mattermost channel later. Um, one of the one of the delights for me this morning was uh, kind of a blast from the past. Uh, we're on the Massive Wiki channel in Mattermost. Uh, we ended up talking about. Um, a little bit of structured data, like if you have data in a database, how, how might you represent that in a Markdown wiki? Um, and even if it's a good idea, usually it's not. Um, but anyway, some, some back and forth discussion uh, led me to talk a little bit about what we called category pages back in around 2001 on wikis. Um, categories were the equivalent, um, the information equivalent of what we call tags or hashtags now. Um, and so it kind of took me back to that time, you know, 2002, 2003, 2004, um, when Flickr um, implemented tags uh, and folksonomy. Uh, folksonomy was a word coined by Thomas Vanderbilt, one of the folks back in that community back in the day. Um, so I remember thinking, oh my gosh, we call it categories. We should call it tags. Um, that was a, a total branding mistake. Um, uh, so poking around back then, I, I found some uh, photos from something called Tag Camp, uh, which was in Silicon Valley in 2005. And there was, back in the day, um, it was a, a rich and vibrant community of, of folks doing all kinds of cool stuff um, uh, before the dot-com boom, kind of. And there was a, a photographer, uh, amateur, no, a photographer, not really an amateur, uh, Scott Beal, he also had a, a web hosting company, a blog, blog hosting company um, called Laughing Squid. So we call them Laughing Squid usually. Anyway, he's got some amazing photos from Tag Camp and just looking at the folks from uh, 2005 uh, um, brought me right back to that day. It was, it was a, a joy and a wonder. Um, and I wish I could kind of like capture that feeling and, and convey it to you because um, it was a special time with a bunch of special people. And, you know, it was like right back there. It's really, really cool. Um, uh, today, I, I have a, uh, maybe you don't want it, but I have a COVID PSA. Um, the pandemic is not over. My wife and I still wear a mask anytime we're sharing air with people, uh, including the uh, university reunion I went to. I was like one of two or three people, you know, and in, in a couple hundred people. And we were mostly outdoors, but we were indoors sometimes. I had my mask on literally the whole time, except for somebody um, finally convinced me to, to hold my breath and take it off for 20 seconds to take one of the photos. But all the other photos, I, I felt kind of stupid, but I had my mask. Um, uh, I want to convey that the stupid feeling faded quickly and the feeling that I knowing that I didn't get COVID um, was really has been really satisfying since then. Um, uh, I think most of society has moved on from COVID and we don't worry about it anymore. Um, my wife and I still worry about it. Um, and when we hear people stories about people um, who might have had health problems before COVID um, end up dying now. Um, uh, we wonder, you know, was that because of COVID? Was it not because of COVID? Um, I hear of uh, uh, airplane accidents. You know, a, a pilot makes this kind of a simple error of being told to wait until another plane lands, and then all of a sudden he's he's taking off um, and clips the other plane. Why did you take off? It's like I don't know. I was, you know, I don't know. It's too much going on. Um, to me, that sounds a lot like um, potentially uh, COVID brain injury. Um, so I, I wonder if we're going to see more of more of that coming up. Um, anyway, today uh, we're getting our, our vaccine. Um, so sorry for talking scary. Um, know that I'm still wearing a mask uh, whenever I'm sharing air with folks. Um, and um, please get your vaccines. Um, one last thing, the Plex was kind of interesting yesterday because there's a lot of AI stuff on it and in, in it. Um, uh, and I, reflecting on whether or not that's good or bad, I don't know. Um, I, I could talk a lot about that. But this week, 
there were a couple interesting, there was a really interesting discussion um, on Fellowship of the Link, which is kind of an OGM uh, community, sub-community um, with a bunch of uh, geeks who talk about hypertext and things like that. Um, one, one of the smart folks there, uh, Aram Zucker Scharf, uh, said something really interesting. He's like, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know how useful this, this whole thing is. And um, I made the statement, something like conversational interfaces to computing um, and, and information, I think it's the future. And I think it's going to sweep the world in the same way that PCs did, and then uh, GUIs did, and then touchscreen interfaces did. I, the next big thing is, for me, conversational interfaces to computers. You're going to be talking to your computing environment rather than looking at a screen. Um, Aram was not convinced at all. <laughs> he made a pretty good argument that, uh, eh, I don't, I don't see the point. I get the the idea that a lot of people are finding ChatGPT like a fun toy and and useful kind of for some things, but I don't see it getting big. Um, I I argued the other way that. Um, and I really surprised myself by saying, I get that ChatGPT is hard for most people to use. Um, that was a really surprising thing to hear me say, but I, I know that it's true. Um, ChatGPT is easy to try and hard to, counterintuitively hard to adopt into your, into your daily practice of, of information flow and tasks, digital, uh, digital mediated tasks. I, the way I think of it, anything that you're doing it with a computer, you should have ChatGPT sitting next to you so that you can say, hey, what am I, you know, remind me what I'm doing. Uh, how do I do this thing? Is it true that blah, 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 whatever. Um, and I, I know that we can't depend on the current version of ChatGPT to, to answer truthfully, but even a structured answer that, that I have to like, I, a lot of times the structured answers are just good enough. You know, I need an outline for a paper. I need, uh, you know, I need to know how the uh, arguments go on this command line tool. Uh, how do you, um, how do you set this setting in, in, you know, a web design application or something like that? And it will give me an answer that is, you know, in the moment, easy for me to converse with and find. Um, and all that stuff is great. Um, but even an answer that I don't know if it's true or not, you know, uh, what was that quote from Voltaire about blah, blah, blah. Um, and sometimes we'll make up an answer, sometimes it won't, but I can, I have, you know, a structure that I can, I can work against. So my, the, the way I think of it, it's like, if you're using a computer, you should have a computer for your computer. It's called ChatGPT. Um, uh, it's very interesting. The, the thing where, Aram said, yeah, I don't think this is going to be a big deal. Um, and I think it's going to be a really big deal. And also, it was a really surprise for me to say that, yeah, it's not there yet. It's, it's too hard for most people to use. Even though it's really easy to try, it's hard to adapt. Um, finally, there's, uh, I'm, I'm involved in a couple places in uh, entrepreneurship in the AI field. Um, and um, it's, it's starting to get going bigger and bigger. There's more and more of it going. Uh, and also the discussion spaces I know of for it are, uh, kind of vacuums right now. Not a lot of conversation is going on, which surprises me. Um, if you're interested in entrepreneurship and a in the AI space, um, or especially maybe if you know somebody who is, um, I'd love to talk to you to figure out where we're going to have these conversations because we aren't having enough of them. Um, uh, and I know it, it's, we, we had on the same fellowship link call, we had, uh, I think also in feature is brain, we had a back and forth, you know, is this all a fad or not? Um, there, there is certainly an AI fad going on, a tool at bulb thing going on, but there's also from, from my point of view, at least there's a lot of real stuff going on underneath and, and we need to start digging into it. Thanks. So um, I knew my check-in was going to be about how the Mideast and what was happening there is basically encompassing everything part, everything in my life, every piece of my life it's touching and how I was working hard to separate, you know, to lean on my spiritual principles and keep my energy 
clean for lack of a better word. But I have to say that I'm even more uncomfortable at the lack of attention being paid to it. Um, you know, I, I didn't come last week because I knew the conversation was gonna be on music. And I was really, really disappointed because like how um, Doug C is talking about the need for the conversations. And I look to this group as such an important group. It's just, it's, it's, it's really distressing to me that there isn't conversation in this particular group about what's happening in the Middle East. For myself, I'm in different groups where it's hard to have a conversation because they're private groups and they're either 100% pro-Israel and you cannot speak about anything else without being called an anti-Semite or they're totally pro-Palestinian and you're not for peace and you don't care about people and there is very little in between. And I'm still in the learning phase. It's only been in this past month that I've, and, and I have, my views have consistently changed. I mean, I'm still the same person. I still have the same values. I still always know there's many sides. Most importantly, I've been on some when I say pro-Palestinian, this is specifically heavily Muslim site where I don't want to speak too much because I got to be honest, I don't feel totally safe, but I have seen some fake AI generated. I mean, I, I watched a video of Netanyahu saying, admitting, which I know is false, that they bombed the hospital. And it absolutely looks like a real video. And all I could do is just comment that we know for a fact this is why, you know, there's enough to be genuinely upset about. Why do you have to put the fake stuff, you know, and just, you know, putting in a, and they, they left my comment there. I also reported it. <laughs> um, but then there's other videos and there's no way to authenticate anything. And this is on both sides, all sides. And it's it's frightening. It's really, really frightening. You know, I wasn't upset in the beginning when people were upset that their non-Jewish friends weren't reaching out to them. I didn't get upset because I know my friends look at me as American. I'm, I, I'm not that sensitive that I felt I needed a personal, oh, how are you doing? I appreciated it, but I... That was not a big deal to me. It's becoming a big deal that I don't see. I don't see more of an effort to show how Muslims and Jews are basically in the same situation as far as hate crime in our country. And I don't see why that is not. You know, there's this, it's just hard for that to become the focus because of what's happening separately. And again, the fact that we're not discussing it in a group like this that I respect so much, I just feel like my heart racing and my blood boiling. So I had to mention that and thank you. And I know it's not intentional.
So I just want to say a few things in response to um, <clears throat> to some of the things that I've heard um, and share a little bit about um, my own perspective and, and what's been floating around in my brain lately. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I don't remember what the context was, but the, the question put was, when was the last time you had a huge belly laugh? And um, what immediately came to mind was um, within a few days of that occurrence, I had been reflecting on, reflecting on what's, <clears throat> <laughs> it's like a tuba sound. <laughs> I've been reflecting on, on, you know, what's going on externally in the world. And I just started to laugh in, into the deepest part of my belly. It wasn't that I didn't care. It's that every capacity that I knew and learned for sense making in the world, it, it, it just, it just, it, it didn't touch anything about what was going on externally. It didn't get anywhere near it. You cannot make sense of this. At least I cannot make sense of this. Um, and, and each different episode contributes to what Gil just was, you know, professionally categorized by his sister as PTSD. And I've been saying for a while, we're living in a, we're all living in a PTSD world. I've been saying it publicly, I've been saying it teaching. You can't make this stuff up. I heard recently that somebody newly elected to Congress got there and said, you know, these people are really very smart. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But I mean, this is the context that we are, we're trying to do our best and, and exist in. Doug, I understand your frustration. I've seen your sharing of chapters picking up and, and you're sharing good stuff. Um, and I understand we ought to be talking about this, but, but somehow at this moment in time, and, you know, I, I have a sense it will, you know, it will, it will change. Um, I don't know that there's anything to do, but just kind of watch it all unravel, watch it unraveling. I mean, you know, I, I keep using the phrase tilting at windmills because um, it seems like that's that's what we're doing. And yeah, we, we I think, do, do the best when we um, try to carry on with the good work that we're all doing. Um, but it's hard. You know, it's not easy. It's, 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 it's really is hard. Somebody said yesterday, I think, um, I can't remember who it was. They had gotten calls from two of their good friends saying, I don't know that I can stay here anymore. You know, um, it's just getting too crazy and a little bit too insane. Um, it's pretty nuts. It's pretty nuts. And this is, you know, this is coming out of the out of the being of someone who's usually, you know, pretty positive and that, you know, we can, we can um, um, you know, we can fix this. We need to keep tilting at windmills. I don't know if we can fix it, but at least at least we can keep ourselves upright. Um, here we are. It's it's you know it's the world that it's the world that that seems to have manifested itself um, around us. The only solace was was um, at some spiritual perspective, um, some metaphysical perspective. You know, I've heard it said that oh, this is the plane you come to feel feelings. This is the plane of existence, the only plane of existence where you can feel these 
these feelings. Well, we're getting a dose. <laughs> we're getting a dose this this current lifetime. Thank you for listening. And there are tears behind all of this. I'm walking around tearful most of the time when I stop and pay attention to what's going on inside. I'd like to talk about two pretty different things. One of them is really pragmatic and the other one is uh, related to the topic that's come a bunch a bunch of times now on this call. Um, the first one is I'm trying to uh, redo my Patreon page. I've had a Patreon page for like seven years since they first came out. And um, there's a whole bunch I can say about that, except that uh, Patreon just had a big makeover recently. And there's a beautiful video by Jack Conti, the founder of Patreon, and I will share it when we're back to using the chat. Um, there's a beautiful video of um, what he means and what it's supposed to be able to do and all that. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then you start using their software and you're like, wait, what? Because Because the software seems not to match the promise of of the vision. And that seems to be, and Pete and I have had a couple of conversations about this, that seems to be sort of endemic, maybe to Patreon and maybe just to the industry. Um, but it would be really lovely to have a more powerful platform from which to do things like that. And part of my question, and I've been asking this in a couple of places, including with Pete, is what other platforms? Um, and I went and looked at Kofi and uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm not a Kickstarter because I'm not a one-time project sort of thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's no better platform right now than Patreon. But then if you go look at Patreon project pages, which used to be really interesting, Patreon project pages for everybody, they used to be a, almost always an explainer video that they that the, the creator had to uh, produce and then some explanation of what the mission was and so forth. And now all they've done is whatever tiers you, you set up for donating, for, for being a backer, those tiers show up under the name of the page. There's a little link that says about which there where there might or might not be a good explanation of what this person is doing. And it's completely dumbed down. It's very weird and, and distressing to me because I, I, I loved the old way it worked and I'd love to be able to do more of that. And I'll find a workaround. I'll, I'll do something different. But it's just weird that maybe what happened was they found that the click rate and the signup rate was better when all they did was show the, the tears. And that just seems odd to me. It seems totally off. And then secondly, I've been going through a whole bunch of um, documents. Basically, um, I, I had like 25 boxes of, of um, files from my life, my parents' lives, and my maternal grandparents' lives to go through, which I'd been dragging along with me for years and years and years, never got to. And I'm finally like making my way through. And we, April and I call this melting boxes because the boxes are annoying just sitting there. And what I'm doing is I'm throwing away 80%, 90%, scanning uh 15% and then keeping maybe 5% which are the important documents i just actually want to have the original of but the scanning is really fun because it it sort of creates a compendium that i can kind of back up online but that i where i can see a lot of family history and i've hit a bunch of interesting things including um and this is a piece of my family history that relates to what's happening here um i, I learned when i was 24 years old that my mother's father's mother was jewish I, nobody had ever told me. I didn't know that. I, I knew that, you know, uh, my, my, so my maternal, my mother's maiden name is Krauthammer, and she was born in Berlin in 1934. She passed away a couple of Decembers ago. Um, but, uh, and I knew that my family had escaped Germany in 39, but we'd never, ever talked about how, why, what, the background. And it's really interesting that when I was little, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents visited us a lot. And I loved to be put to sleep by my grandmother. And I would always ask her to tell me stories about my mom when she was young. And I never got good stories. They just didn't want to share the stuff that happened way back when. And I think it was like weird and, and it was awful. 
And so I've got a, a bunch of documents now. And I have, for example, the original steamship tickets that my grandmother and the two kids had to get out of Hamburg to head toward the Caribbean, where I think they met up with my grandfather, who had left, who left a couple months after. <clears throat> um, and they had like a short little window. I found documents that are character witnesses and a, an approval by the by the Berlin Police Department saying they're good to go. They have 30 days to get out of town with a swastika stamp on the bottom. And then I went through a stack of, of onion skin correspondence. If anybody remembers when airmail was expensive, everybody used to use onion skin paper, which was really light uh, and almost transparent, but kind of strong. And so I, I had a whole stack of, of correspondence in German. And I speak enough German to make my way through with a little help of Google Translate for the hard words. Um, I got through, a, I read the stack and found a bunch of a bunch of history because every now and then my grandfather, who I called Opie, would relate a piece of the story of his his life story and it was really interesting and i'll i'll just add the, the there's just like this incredibly poignant part about my my grandfather's life which is he had two ways of making a living when up until that point oh sorry that's that apple sonoma feature when you <clears throat> excuse me when you hold up a v it sends balloons into the screen because it thinks you're celebrating by the way this cascades the celebration uh thing <clears throat> so now you know um and just i can't help it this does the laser light show which all of which by all of which leavens my conversation a little bit with humor which i really appreciate um so anyway my grandfather had two ways of making a living he was a shoe representative so i don't think he sold shoes on the show on the floor but he represented shoemakers wholesale uh, to other sh shoe shops and he dressed merchants windows <clears throat> which means Writing sale on Sunday, 20% off, putting merch in the window, all of that. I learned that he fell off a ladder. He had to jump off a ladder in 1943, which is later. Sorry. He had to jump off a ladder and got injured. And there's a whole story about that in his correspondence. But in, in this document, he writes about... Um, how he'd been fired from the shoe shop because his bo boss was worried that he'd lose a government contract for having a Jew working for him. <clears throat> and then he describes how on 8th of November, 1938, his life fell apart. <clears throat> and that date might be uh, familiar to you all. It's Kristallnacht. And it's the night that Joseph Goebbels went on the radio and said, hey, if anything bad were to happen to Jewish merchants' shops and synagogues, we would look the other way. And German citizens went, and destroyed an incredible number of stores and synagogues. Damn this cold. Um, and then the first time I, I sort of discovered this was when I had gone to Germany to put my grandfather in a nursing home in Baden-Baden, where they lived out their lives. And I read this, uh, a piece of this back then, and I thought this all this correspondence was lost. And now I have it again. But... Um, on that day, my grandfather's second way of making a living is surgically wiped out. And in the documents, I wrote, one of the documents I read this week, he says, my life was shattered. Not only did all the Jewish merchants' windows go away, but all the, all the non-Jews who were hiring me kindly were scared that, to death and stopped hiring me. Uh, and at that point, I think his full-time job was getting them alive out of Germany. Um, so I didn't necessarily mean to share all of that right now in our call, but... Um, it seems like we're it seems like we're moving globally into times that need stronger interventions the way Doug C is asking us to do. And um, I'm mindful that we are a good group of thoughtful people who might do more. So thank you.
So I pretty much live full time in the space of the question of what is doing what does doing mean um, in the face of everything. And I had a couple of really interesting conversations this week out of which some things surface that I think um, are very much living for me that I'd love to share here. Um, one of them is around all of the technology centered uh, emergences and challenges and, and debate and questioning. And one of the things that came, came to me was um, that we're actually in the middle of the singularity. In fact, not as an abstract concept, and not reduced to machine being as smart as or smarter than the Turing test, right? It's literally our technology capabilities and affordances have surpassed our ability to control them, to understand them, to um, manage them in just about every domain. And so the tail is wagging the dog and the results of that are things like, you know, QAnon is an alternative reality amusement park for gamer coders um, escaping the reservation and going into the general public and all of a sudden it's turned the world upside down, ethically, morally, et cetera. Um, the consequences of all these things, the fact that in principle, a rambunctious high school student or college student with a, um, a CRISPR apparatus and AI can design a virus idly and propagate and release it into the world that would wipe out our species. And those means are at hand for anybody. It's, all, it's out there, like it's open source. And the largest systems and enterprise structures and data structures in the world today defy any one or group of sysops to fully know and understand all of the moving parts involved. So um, that's one piece of the puzzle. And um, to do about that ultimately comes down to the human being deploying using the technology and the decisions and, and, and values, ethics, morals, or lack thereof um, in the hands of, in, held by the user. So it ultimately reduces back to my mind to the human, the human values and orientation. So that's one piece of the puzzle. And the other piece of the puzzle was, um, again, human-centered, Is it possible in the most complex, intractable, dark, and horrendous contexts to change the orientation and consciousness and perspective to inquiry, curiosity, and opportunity? Like, how could this, a recontextualization here? flip the script and materially change and transform 
the orientation to what's going on. So I had mentioned a ways back playing around and noodling with the idea of if the petrochemical oil industry, fossil fuel industry decided to transition and transform to remediating all the damage that it's cost the planet um, and repurposing all its infrastructure and assets to that mission, there's plenty of money to be made doing that. In the Middle East, um, if Israel were to relate to this situation not as the extermination of Hamas, but actually the rescue of its hostages and the Palestinians. What would that do? Not just in in Gaza, but on the left bank, on the on the West Bank, and so, and in all of this, it's in the recontextualization, transformation, reorientation to the way that I think about it to uh, the way we think about it to a change the game, change the reality. And that in just about every context, that's possible instantaneously if there's enough collective shift fast enough. And I think the world is sort of there, like the vast bulk grassroots bottom-up populations involved in all of this don't want it. Like they're, they're there to be catalyzed. And for the first time in, in our history, unprecedentedly, the technologies available enable a collective viral catalyzing of those intrinsic potentials to flip scripts and change orientations and just stop the insanity and uh, reorient. So that's um, that I'm complete, but that's what's been living for me. We had we had lost power, which is why I dropped off. So I logged on and probably about um, 30 seconds before Doug started. So, uh, yeah, it's uh at times uh as far as and check in, I'm just I'm gonna be taking uh time off on the thirteenth to seventeenth of November. So just trying to we cover from this crazy year of not knowing if I was going to have to move and all the, and then actually moving in under the same roof. <laughs> Everything's still in the basement. Um, and things, um, I guess, with. Uh, let's see. I actually was using this the other day. This was actually my screen. This happened to my screen while I was on a uh, call at, <laughs> at work and stuff. So I actually did, um, I actually did um, go and grab the, <laughs> uh, looks damn close <laughs> to the matrix. Um, and so, um, yeah, I've just, uh, I, um, the deadline was yesterday, so I uh, went ahead and applied to re-enroll in the PhD program starting in January. So it's um, 
trying to act together. And then um, there's a guy, Dan Rome. Uh, he wrote a book, The Back of the Napkin. He actually has a Napkin University. And he's uh, got a, a course time to write your book and stuff. So I'm kind of signed up for that. I have uh, a friend who's work wants to work on her book. So we're going to kind of be accountability thing. She, I'm um, actually um, helping her with um, organizing things in the brain, so actually sharing one of the licenses with her. And uh, then um, trying to see, uh, kind of have the really um, fo focus my, my quote unquote book is like the telling the high level story of, of the dissertation kind of thing and then kind of having that dynamic of um, kind of um, helping to focus and then my my um, chair gave me an ultimatum that I she needed to see writing and that I needed to be writing for a 14 year old audience so <laughs> it's like I so there's that dynamic of um, you know right having to write for the academic audience, but then so I'm thinking, can it kind of be two layers? So you could have you could have like a like the level for the general audience and then dive in each section kind of dive into the into the um, into the research. So um, yeah, it's the pieces are coming kind, of, kind of coming together. So I've got three um, I've got it's a nine component framework, but I got three stories that are addressing three of three each and stuff. So I'm feeling feeling pretty good about that and trying to look at settle casting. I think I mentioned that before, but <laughs> just trying to figure out how to have a more structured approach and time blocking and all that stuff. So that's kind of where I'm I'm at right now. That'll stop. Doug, I think you went earlier, and I think we are missing a couple people who still haven't checked in. So I'm wondering if those people would like to check in. If you'll hold on a sec, Doug. Yeah, I'll... Uh... It's very short this week. Um, I've been reading a book on, based on some lectures by the political theorist Wendy Brown called Nihilistic Times, and the subtitle is Thinking with Max Weber. But what struck me in reading this is this whole idea about thinking with. So she's has done this for years, has gone back to Max Weber's writings on vocation and politics and is trying to, in these lectures, show what some of that writing has to say to what we're experiencing right now and how we might, as I read it, think with what Max Weber wrote about what we're actually in 
involved in right now. And so I guess I, that's, I mean, so I'm attempting to do that. And I think maybe on calls like this, we might be attempting to do that, what I might call thinking together with each other. And I don't know how that might be represented after the fact. I don't know. I'm uh, sorry I came in late. We had our time zone change last weekend here, and I just assumed that uh, America would go back from daylight savings to uh, winter time at the same moment. But I'm glad I'm here for the last half hour. Uh, a lot of things on my mind, but I'll also keep it short so other people can discuss things that were said. Uh, I think I mentioned the last time I was on one of these calls that we were planning a series of uh, intergenerational dialogues in October, uh, bringing together uh, teenagers from 16 to 18 years and uh, society's elders, as we call them, uh, older than 60 and in connection with World Values Day on the 12th of October and the 19th of October, uh, we had two two-hour dialogues. And Stuart, nice to see you again. Uh, Stuart was in the group that uh, thought together and helped put this uh, first prototype together. Uh, we had uh, young people from Nigeria and Kenya, from India and the UK. And there were elders from 10 different countries uh, ranging from American Americans who got up very early to Australians who stayed up very late. Uh, there were 36 people in the first session, 16 in the second one. And uh, what I was very happy to uh, experience is that uh, young people, at least the young people we had on the calls, were enthusiastic articulate, aspirational, ready to take part in making society better. They weren't at all stressed and fearful as uh, so many media, uh, media issues report them to be. And they were not afraid to speak their minds. Uh, young people in India who said uh, uh, they're happy they're in a democracy and they don't like at all what their government is doing and they're planning to uh, take their voices uh, uh, out of the homes and the schools and the streets to let them government know that not everyone supports them. Uh, so it was a very inspiring uh, uh, experience, although lots of things went wrong. There were very big technical issues. Uh, Wi-Fi in the UK was horrible. And in Nigeria, it was okay. And in India, it was excellent. But essentially, the young people from the UK couldn't be heard and could only engage in using the chat to bring their ideas forward. Uh, the time zones made it difficult for people to take part. Uh, it was hard to get uh, young people, and it was hard to... Uh, uh, have the uh, elders understand that it was supposed to be a conversation and uh, not a, a stage that uh, older people could preach uh, to the younger. But all in all, everyone was uh, very pleased. A lot of the people on the calls, especially the young people, said if there were more calls, they'd like to take part. And so now uh, with different groups, we're trying to think of ways to take it further, get, over, get around technical issues, uh, have different conversations in different time zones to really involve people 
in America and Australia with people in Europe and people in Asia and uh, learn as we go along because uh, as our assumption in advance was uh, young people and older people have a lot to say to each other, uh, proved the need to follow at any rate in these two uh, prototypes to be true. Or any and all ideas uh, from OGM are, are certainly welcome. Hank, thank you so much. Um, glad you joined. Sorry about the time change. We changed this Sunday, uh, oh. I think. Is, uh, yeah, this Sunday we we shift again. So it's going to screw you up next week as well. So <laughs> just to keep you on your toes. Um, I, I understand, Karen, thank you for being on this call. I understand you'd like to pass, which is fine, which I think means everybody's checked in. And uh, Karen, if you would like to say something, just feel free to, to jump in whenever. Uh, and uh, off to Doug, Doug C. Well, I have to say that I've been appalled a bit by this call and the lack of touching on key issues. Uh, I'm inclined to think, well, I fought the impulse of uh, leaving. Uh, it wasn't hard to f defeat that impulse, but it was a struggle. Uh, I think that uh, the singularity is the point where humans become as stupid as computers. And I think that Don Quixote was right. Uh, they're not windmills, they're dragons. And that's where we are. And Um, and Karen, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to thank you for all your thoughts and I'll be back. Excellent. Love that. Thank you. And this one's different from many of our calls. So it's, uh, it's an interesting experiment. Um, Doug, I appreciate your challenging us to aim higher. I'm unclear what you think aiming higher would be like and how it would work. <clears throat> um, well, I'm enough of a scientist to think that starting with the facts is a way to uh, liberate the imagination. And we're in the situation where uh, CO2 is rising Temperature is going to continue to rise. Uh, we're moving into desperate territory. And the issue is, how does this end? And we can still talk about it, even if there's nothing we can do. Uh, there's dignity in facing the truth. I think most and everybody... Maybe, just, just possibly, just possibly something will emerge. But it can't emerge if we're not talking about it. Um, this is not a series of calls about climate change crisis. That's not what this is. This is a, a group of people meeting to talk about a whole bunch of things that might, as one byproduct, um, help solve the global climate change crisis. But there's, as far as I, when I count, when I look out and count, I see five or six simultaneous crises of which climate change is just one. And we're not talking about any of them. I thought we talked about quite a few of them today um, in several different ways. Uh, Gil, go ahead. I was, I was surprised by your comment, Doug, about not touching on key issues because we've touched on at least Israel, Palestine, and climate and the singularity, and perhaps a few other things. We haven't had, you know, we're doing check ins, so we're not having back and forth conversation on them, but those were all live in this conversation. And we've talked about some, we've talked about climate certainly in more detail other times. Um, so I'm, I'm perplexed by your comment. 
And I'm interested in your question, Doug, partly because I've tried in OGM to get us to create a permanent record of note taking and ideas woven together and what this thing I call the big fungus. And I do that every time in my brain. So each call I, I weave a bunch of stuff and I post it you know, openly on, on the web uh, in hope that that newly woven context is useful to solving some of the problems. But frankly, um, I, no, we, we haven't gotten very far on doing any of that. And that would be starting from facts. That would be covering the major issues. That would be a whole lot of good stuff. So my angle on how might we improve these conversations has not really worked. And I'm happy, I'm happily still doing my own note taking and probably have gotten a little better at it since we started OGM calls. I think that my my methods for for note taking are, are some somehow a little bit crisper. Um, but that's not helping anybody at this point either. Uh, Stuart, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, I was I was just gonna add is uh, uh, that um I think this is one of the last places of people who aren't aware of what's going on in the world. Um, so the notion of you know not talking about it or not thinking about it doesn't necessarily mean that people don't have um, awareness or consciousness um, about it. I just needed to kind of push back on that a little bit. I don't think a, a week goes by when there's not some conversation or someone sharing a project that is in some way a contribution to the polycrisis, multi-crisis that we all face. Could we do more? Yeah, could we spend, you know, could everyone spend every waking hour? You know, might that be called for? Um, is somebody doing that? Um, don't know, but I think that's, you know, continuing to stand straight up and um, not succumb to um, emotions that bowl us over, uh, I think is a um, is a useful perspective. Thanks, Stuart. Um, uh, Stacy, I'll pass to you next. Um, that's funny that you raised your hand just as I was about to address what you had brought into the conversation earlier. Um, it seems a really great idea to make next week's OGM call about the Israel-Gaza situation and to see if we can bring our best game to it um, and step it up a bit. Uh, so I will, I will um, unless somebody thinks it's a terrible idea, I will make that next week's topic. Um, go ahead. I just have one sentence to say because it struck me. What I don't think we're aware of, because I mean, I certainly wasn't, is the deep fear being experienced by many people. And, and that's something that in coming to in conversation is important to come out. I really did not understand. And not only did I not understand, I didn't experience it the way I'm starting to experience it now. And I think that's telling as well. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Stacey. I, I think the framing of PTSD, of a collective PTSD, um, to some might seem hyperbolic, but there's also something sort of called collective trauma, <clears throat> and there's intergenerational trauma, and there's a bunch of other kinds of things that happen. And, and one of the things that's going on is that we're all afraid of which shoe is going to drop next. It's like we're Imelda, we're in Imelda Marcus's closet <laughs> and in an earthquake. <laughs> and it's like, am I going to be killed by the Jimmy Choo's? I don't know. Uh, Cause they do have stiletto heels, but, um, but PTSD is an interesting way to describe this. And it makes me think that the movements that might be uh, productive to solve some of these problems might involve how you handle PTSD at a social level to start sort of approaching people in different ways. We have just a couple minutes more. Um, who would like to jump in and pick up any topic that we touched on or anything else you'd like to bring in? Or I just wanna, ahead, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't know if to raise my hand or not, but yeah, that's fine. 
Um, well, I know you all know this, but we're we're just meant to be in a tribe and have all the in the input that we can respond to. Um, but we have so much going on media wise. It's just every day over consumption is what's happening. We're eating too much and we're not meant to eat that much and not bad food either. So in the metaphorically speaking, um, there's a balance of what you're going to choose to take in or I choose to take in. And um, it's not having the media on so much more than other people that I know in my circle. And I just hear it from my circle then what's happening to be frank. And my, I've been told, I've been told that I'm not uh, in touch with what the news is. <laughs> that's, that's the negativity part of it. Yes, I get it. But I will go and look for it and I'll pull it when I need it. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm going to bring this down to the, the moment of agency and control and um, well-being for ourselves and individually, because we all have to choose that for ourselves first. And I think that if we can bring into our day today as just when we're eating, to use that as a metaphor to um, nourish ourselves only with something nourishing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stuart. Oh, I was just gonna <clears throat> say at some time, I have a poem that seems like a, a workly, uh, worthy cap on, on <clears throat> on what we've been saying. That seems like a great way to, to wrap this call. And Ken being in Italy and all, this is a great thing. Uh, Bill, did you want to say something before the poem? Yeah, I had two thoughts that uh, just, if I, can, if I can process them. Um, well, just what Jesse said was really interesting. Um, just about focusing you know, on eating and trying to, I will say being older, somehow portion control is, uh, I would say it's easier just because my eyes aren't quite as big, bigger than my stomach right now. Um, but the thing that I know you said that, you know, when you said, well, we're all parts of tribes and I've been trying to push myself to not think like that. It's like, this is what we always say. I'm like, well, don't say that. I've been trying to like, can we not just say, it's always been like, you know, this is just the way it is. And I would like to like say to myself, maybe it isn't like that or it doesn't have to be like that or it's just been like that. So I think there is some way to try and think about things differently or just to get out of what we consider to be, this is the way things are. And I don't, I mean, that's just my struggle right now. I've been trying to force myself to do that. So I don't fall into we're all parts of tribes, therefore, blah, blah, blah. It's like, maybe the premise is like, like <laughs> just throw the premise out. And then maybe I'd have different, uh, you know, next steps. And I've lost the other thing because, you know, what can I tell you? I couldn't remember it. Uh, Stuart, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, so this is actually today's poem. <clears throat> it's the poem for November 2nd, and it's called Aftermath. <clears throat> Aftermath. And um, the reflective questions are, um, do you interact with people whose views <clears throat> differ from yours? <clears throat> what, you, what might you learn with curiosity <clears throat> and empathy? Aftermath. Now the time here, the place, begin to act from grace. Begin to act from grace. Battle joined action noble, fighting only generates trouble. Breach created by push or shove, then we show what we're made of. Character that's truly real, display how to teach and heal. Fierce fight on the wire, no winner or one to retire. Combat in venues changing, players thinking, rearranging. Can we learn from
from Winter's <clears throat> Night. Can we learn from Winter's Night? Can body politic cease to fight? Energy wasted, silly fray, better spent another way. Winner loser, a very old frame. <clears throat> How about a bigger game? Perhaps sacred collaborations, a new pulse for great nations. We have tools, technology. Let's aspire to real democracy. Time to move in this direction. Let others watch and pay attention. Thanks, Stuart. This pesky cough. Cough isn't letting me talk much. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Um, really appreciate appreciate your being here and um, pondering everything we said. Until next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>